Hey guys, good morning. It is Thursday, March. Nope, April 2nd. That's awesome. Good start. It's uh, Thursday, April 2nd, and um, we're here again to kind of just discuss over the notes that you guys had to take uh, last week. So we've been talking about Alfred Wegener, and we've been talking about his three major um, pieces of evidence that he found for his theory on continental drift. Remember that we were saying how other scientists in the field of geology especially um, were not accepting of Alfred Wegener and his crazy ordeals and his crazy theories of how the continents were um, moving over time slowly. Uh, and the re main reason why they didn't really believe in him because at the time this was such an absurd theory that he came up with. Even after presenting his evidence, it seemed like all the scientists kind of just found excuses to like say... You know, Alfred makes a good point, but because he can't explain the driving force, the driving mechanism, you know, we're not going to believe him. All right, so as time goes on further, we have more scientists that are kind of on Alfred's side, but like still kind of not. So, all right, but what they need is they need to get the hardcore evidence that Alfred wasn't able to obtain. Or he found some really good pieces of evidence, such as you know the mountain ranges um, and the coal fields matching up across vast dif uh, distances. He found the use of fossils. He used ancient paleoclimate. Right, but still, that wasn't enough information, right? So it wasn't until there was evidence of his theory of continental drift that we started to find out deeper amounts of evidence in the ocean floors. All right, so what we're looking at now is we're looking at so further evidence that clearly des describes and explains exactly what Alfred was unable to describe and explain with the use of technology that he didn't have at the time before his death. All right, so what we have underneath the ocean floor is these underwater mountain chains or these underwater mountains all right, and volcanoes that create these uh, ridges. And we call this ridge system all right, a mid-ocean ridge, MOR for short. And what these ridge systems do, if you look at the alignment or the orientation of where they're located, all right, you can start to see a pattern kind of like that of a baseball. Right, the seams on a baseball that run up and down the baseball and loop around, you get to see somewhat of a pattern of exactly where these mountain chains link up, right? where they come together, areas where they're coming apart or they're diverting from each other, and then you can find areas where they start to collide, right? or a collision boundary, where they start to form these underwater mountain ranges. Right? So with the use of sonar, all right, sonar is a, uh, an instrument that we have on certain ships, all right, um, to catch fish, all right, sonar can be used to map the ocean floor. Some um, organisms, such as blue whales, they use a form of sonar and bats, such as echolocation. All right, so what sonar allows it to do, up top to the bottom of, cer of certain ships, all right, there is a transmitter and there's a receiver. So what the transmitter is going to do, it's going to send out a wavelength, all right, like an echo. All right, and that wavelength is going to travel down to the ocean floor. All right? So when a wavelength or an echo bounces off another object, it's going to reflect that sound and it's going to travel back into the receiver. Okay? So what we know is we know that if we want to find out a distance. Right? Remember from like very on early in the year, if we wanted to find the distance of an object, the distance of something in motion, all right? we can take the speed at which it's traveling. So the scientists on these ships know exactly how fast these wavelengths are traveling. All right? And we can find the time it takes for that echo, that wavelength, to bounce off the ocean floor and come back into the receiver. If you know the speed at which these echoes are traveling, and you know the time it takes since you eject that echo from the ship's bottom, right, the time it takes for it to reflect off the ocean floor, and the time it takes to return back to the ship, you can calculate the distance. So using this sonar and using these simple physical equ uh, equations and calculations, we can map out the ocean floor to find out exactly what is located beneath the surface of the waves that we can't see because of the high pressure. All right, remember, as you go deeper down to the earth, not only does temperature increase, but so does the, um, the pressure of that object. Okay, so using sonar, we've been able to map out these ridge systems, right? These are called the mid-ocean ridges. All right, and what this is, these are underwater chains of mountains and volcanoes. All right, and if we look at these ridge systems, all right, so right here, here's us over here on the East Coast. This is the nearest ridge system we have near to us is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that goes between uh, North America, between Africa, and between South America, and it goes all the way down to the Indian Ridge, Central Indian Ridge, Southeastern Indian Ridge, and over here on the East Pacific Rise. All right, so what we can look at is that we can look at these ridge systems. So, for example, here's one continental crust over here. Here's the mid 
Here's the ridge, the central valley of that ridge. And then here's another continent on the other side of this ridge system. All right. Here's another. Here's the scuba diver that's traveling in between this mid-ocean ridge. So this is a ridge system where the plates are coming apart or they're diverting. So this plate's going this way. This plate's going this way. All right. And then some ocean ridges, all right, not always are found underneath the waves, right? This part of the mid-Atlantic ridge, here's one ridge over here. Here's another ridge over here. This ridge runs right through the center of Iceland, right? Iceland is a hot spot. It's, a, it's an island. It's a, it's a volcanic island, right? And this red ocean ridge right on this side and on this side actually cuts through the um, that island of Iceland. And um, as you can see here, I don't know why they would draw and make this bridge up here because these two land masses are separating. So Iceland's slowly being cut apart into two separate islands. Okay, so here is another portion of the Middle Atlantic Ridge in uh, Ireland. It's running right through the island, right? So here's one side of this Middle Ocean Ridge on this side. Here's another on this side, all right? And then eventually, as we get more spreading rates and ocean temperatures increase due to global warming, this is what's projected for our um, Earth to look like as rising sea levels uh, inhabit our inland seas, all right? So... We have another hypothesis, so continental drift, still kind of a theory, right? Not really on board yet. Wigner still like this really crazy guy that had these really, really crazy ideas, and he went on this crazy expedition, and he froze to death because he's insane. He's crazy, all right? So Harry Hess, all right, was an American geologist. He was actually a U.S. Navy officer, um, a captain in World War II, and when he was in the in the service at this time, World War II, uh, uh, serving in the U.S. Navy, he was actually around for some of the first trials of using sonar. So between up until Harry Hess, um, he was a um, uh, professor of geology, all right, at um, at Syracuse. Um, but before that, he was in the U.S. Navy, and he was one of the first people that got to really try out this new form of technology that we use today called sonar. Remember, sonar is what we use to map out the ocean floor. It's what uh, allowed us to um, locate and uh, discover um, evidence of mid-ocean ridges. So he came up with this really crazy theory. He said, well, what if Alfred Wegener is right? All right, but maybe I can explain the driving mechanism, the driving force that Alfred couldn't explain. All right. He came up with this theory called seafloor spreading in the 1960s. So he was thinking maybe Alfred was right actually all along. All right. So according to his theory, he's saying, you know, Alfred's kind of right. The continental um, crust and the, the continents and the landmass themselves, they are moving. All right. But what they're not doing <clears throat> is that they're not just floating on top of the water. They're not just scraping along or across um across the ocean floor. What's happening is that the sea floor itself is moving, and as the sea floor itself moves away from each other or towards each other, it's carrying the continents that are located on the ocean floor as well. So the continents aren't actually drifting like Alfred was thinking, right? But what they actually are doing is that they're moving along the ocean floor like a conveyor belt. All right. So when you talk about seafloor spreading, what's exactly happening here? You have your mid-ocean ridge in the center. Right. So here's your central valley. And what's happening in the in the mantle? Remember, convection currents is when hot gases and hot rock start to rise. Right. Because they are less dense. I'll assume you said that. And as they start to cool down, because as you go towards the surface of the Earth, we're in, uh, decreasing the temperature and decreasing the pressure. And then they start to fall down again. All right. So these convection currents on this side. And on this side of the asthenosphere, the weak sphere, remember this is what is like a fluid and it tends to allow the continents to move, all right? It's pushing magma up into this central plume. Right? It's called a mantle plume. And as it pushes this magma into this plume, all right, the magma has nowhere to go except for up, all right? So as it gets forced upward, it's going into the ridge system. So this entire motion ridge is filled in with magma. Slowly over time, all right, this magma is going to start to cool down, all right? And as it starts to cool down, it adds new ocean floor to the surface or to the bottom of the ocean, all right? And then once this hardens, all right, it starts to solidify into new oceanic basalt or the new oceanic floor, all right? Eventually, convection currents are still in play, all right? They're going to push in more magma into that location. So now this underlying magma that's in a liquid state it's going to take that newly solidified basalt and it's going to push it to the side. 
all right? And it acts like a conveyor belt. As you add in more material down here, you're pushing older material this way and pushing older material this way. So it's a conveyor belt. Here's new oceanic crust. Other ones come in and it pushes it along. And it pushes it along. And it pushes along really, really slowly. So eventually what's happening is the sea floor is spreading. Hence, sea floor spreading. All right? So if you look along the ridge system, right, you're but potentially go essentially, you're going to find the youngest rocks along the mid ocean ridge, all right, in red. All right, so for zero to 10 millions of years. And that's because that's where the new oceanic rock basalt is being placed. All right, and as you look away from the ridge, as we get into those darker yellows, greens, and blues, all right, we're increasing the amount of number of years. As you get away from a ridge, all right, you're going to find the older rocks there because that's the older rock that solidified millions and millions of years ago. That's being spread out and pushed away from the mid ocean ridge. And that makes sense. Okay, so. When we look at the ocean ridge, you're going to find the new magma, the youngest in age magma, ocean floor or basalt, right, along the ridge system. And the further away you go from that ridge, you're going to find the rocks tend to get older in age because it's been pushed along the ocean ridge very slowly, like that conveyor belt, over millions and millions of years. All right. So, Harry Hess was more approved in the scientific community, especially for geologists, because he was a professor of geology. This is what he was known to do. He was one of the first scientists also to use sonar. So no one really looked at him and said, you know what, I don't know if you're right with this. They're like, okay, like now you're speaking our language. You're a geologist just like us. We'll listen to you talk. All right? He came up with three main pieces of evidence as well for C4 spreading. All right? That Wagner also found three pieces of evidence, but because of his astronomy and um meteorology background he wasn't as accepted unfortunately in the scientific community all right but Hess was one of Alfred's cheerleaders like he was like cheered minds like you know what? I, I I see what you're saying I kind of agree with you but I'm gonna find my own evidence for my own theory now C4 spreading and he found out evidence of eruptions of molten material magnetic stripes and then ages of rocks all right so what he found all right in the 1960s we as a group of scientists actually ventured to these mid ocean ridges now that we found them using sonar all right we're going to go travel to them all right in a really really small submersible submarine that we call it the alvin the alvin is a very very small submarine you can only, only fit a handful of scientists at one time all right this alvin actually is a submarine that actually located the titanic at the, um, the first sighting of the titanic and what this album would do is it would travel to the depths because it had the um, structure to handle all that pressure, right? It would travel to the depths of the ocean ridges, and what it found were these really, really st strange-looking um, rocks we call pillow uh, pillow basalts. And what pillow basalt is is when the new molten magma, the molten material, rise out of the ocean ridge at first, it's still in a liquid state and still has to start to cool and solidify. But while it's in this liquid state, it's kind of like filling up a balloon with water, for a water balloon. As you put in more and more water into this balloon, it's going to start to expand. The same thing's happening to these rocks. As they're in this molten liquid state, more magma is making these rocks start to form these pillow or water balloon shapes. All right? And as they start to solidify, they form these circular rocks we call pillow basalts. And the only way that these rocks would form under these immense pressure on the ocean floor is if magma was being drawn into it and it, it was ejecting into these pillow basalts all right so that's the first sign of evidence that we have okay maybe magma is erupting from the ocean floor and filling in this basalt and making these weird pillow shaped rocks the second one was magnetic reversals so over millions of years what happens the north pole and the south pole actually switch so if you if it ever a magnetic reversal happened right now and you had a compass you're north would be pointing south, all right? We don't know exactly why this happens, but if you look at the magnetic iron, all right, the iron filings within pillow uh, within basalt, you'll see that at certain portions of um, throughout history, the um, using a magnometer, we can look at these reversals, and we can see that these reversals are on the same on both sides. So we know that they're spreading at the same rate on both sides, and they're switching periodically every. A, a couple um, 780 million uh, 780,000 years all right another piece of evidence that we found is just from core samples so as again using these naval ships we've gotten core samples of these rocks and what we found out is that the rocks along the mid-ocean ridge system in the very central valley they're gonna be your youngest rocks 
other magma is going to come in, push those rocks to the side, and it's going to start to spread along the sea. And this is where you're going to find your older rocks. Right? So this is seafloor spraying by Harry Hess.